Now, the Fixed Term Parliament Act was finally scrapped this week. The legislation, brought in by the Clegg Cameron coalition government in 2011, was designed to solidify the length of each parliament to five years, unless, of course, the House of Commons voted early for an early election, but that would have to be by a two-thirds majority, a peculiar quirk in a majoritarian system. Beforehand, prime ministers had the right to call an early election within each five-year period. However, since the inception of this act, we've seen three general elections in the space of five years and a period of gridlock where MPs clashing over Brexit refused to vote in favour of facing the electorate on three separate occasions. So what's the constitutional and political legacy of the Fixed Term Parliaments Act and what new powers are going to replace it? Well, joining me to discuss this is the Director at the Centre for Parliament and Public Law at the University of Winchester, Craig Prescott. Welcome to the programme. Now, a lot of people are delighting in the fact that the Fixed Term Parliament Act is gone. Why did certain sections of political life hate it so much? Uh, Good afternoon. It was quite clear that this became a complicating factor when it came to um, Brexit in particular. And what it did was it it allowed um, particularly the the Labour Party to uh, perhaps constantly shift its position uh, when it came to Brexit. So the government sort of went and negotiated a deal Perhaps it, it didn't necessarily, um, some on the right of the Conservative Party didn't like the deal, but perhaps it achieved quite a lot of what Labour wanted to do, but Labour still opposed the Brexit deal. Um, but then the other issue, well, OK, if the government doesn't have a majority in the Commons for its sort of main purpose, then ordinarily you would have a motion of no confidence. Well, the Fixed Term Parliament Act interfered with this and it allowed, um, you know, MPs to sort of try and keep the government in office, but not vote with it on its main issue of the day. And as you said, we ended up with gridlock. But then holding an election to resolve this gridlock also became a bit more complicated. So it it just sort of added a different element to that whole Brexit process and, and perhaps an unwelcome element. Um and the left, sort of left the government there returned. it left the government there in office but not in power, as many people uh, said, a very peculiar paralysis that befell our political system. Although it has to be said, an election did eventually come within that term. But that's because more than two thirds of Parliament voted for it. Something that's very peculiar in our system, having these threshold votes. Of course, in constitutional systems where or where Congress or Parliament or whatever the legislative body is, isn't sovereign, um, votes using super majorities sort of make sense because there's a higher authority. But I suppose it's never really made sense to use a supermajority in the case of our parliament because that law could be wiped out with a simple majority of a one-line piece of legislation. Well, and that's actually how we got the 2019 general election because, yes, as you say, the Fixed Term Parliament Act allowed for an early election if two-thirds of MPs voted in favour of, of an early election. But the problem we had in 2019 was that we didn't reach that two-thirds majority. Indeed, uh, on some of the votes, the Labour Party abstained on this, and so you just could never reach that 66% threshold. That was overridden by passing an ordinary piece of legislation, which just required a simple majority. So it was always the case that MPs, if they wanted to hold an early election, could have done by a simple majority, by passing legislation, setting out when the next election would be held, which is actually what happened eventually in 2019 and showed ultimately how futile that 66% threshold was in that it doesn't work in our system of parliamentary sovereignty where the highest form of, of majority we need is a simple majority in the House of Commons and in the House of Lords. Scratching my brains, trying to think if there's any other piece of legislation that demands a two-third 
majority for anything. I, I, I'm not sure there is. Could this mark the beginning and the end of the demand for super majorities at Westminster? I think, you know, this has been an experiment and I think it's one that we're unlikely to return to anytime soon. Um, you can get all sorts of odd um, consequences from a supermajority. Um, in particular, you can oppose by abstaining. And so it makes the whole process of voting politically more complicated. And, you know, politicians, MPs sort of jockeying for position, taking different stances. Um, as we saw with Brexit, it just adds a, a, a complicating factor. And as opposed to the traditional yes, no, simple majority approach. Um, and so I don't see that there's much in going for more super majorities in other pieces of legislation, at least on, a, on an ad hoc basis. We'd have to think about this much more fundamentally. Yes, yeah, certainly. It seems like that's a very different sort of system to the parliamentary system that we enjoy in this country. And perhaps uh, by scrapping this piece of legislation, we're returning to that sense of parliamentary sovereignty that has uh, presided over so much of political debate over the last few years. I'm afraid we've run to the end of this conversation. But for now, thank you very much for joining us there. Uh, of course, Craig Prescott, the director of the Centre for Parliament and Public Law at the University of Winchester.